you. Let's go into the Word of God. Message is just titled Rejoice. And I want to unpack what rejoice is. Now, there are so many Christianese words that we use, and rejoice is one of them. But what's in that? And why should we rejoice? And what's it all about? So I want you to go with me. I want to tell you three things about rejoice. Or three three scriptures. I'm going to read them to you and then I'm going to go back to them. And the first one's in Luke chapter 1 and verse 26. So while you go in your Bible, some of you brought Bibles. I'll give you a chance to do that. I encourage you to bring your Bible. Make sure that your pastor is not making it up, you know? Amen. If your pastor starts making up stuff, then you're in trouble, okay? So you need to check for yourself. And I want to encourage you to be a growing Christian and to know the Word of God and to be filled with the Word of God. And if you go to Luke chapter 1, 26, there in, in the scripture there, it says, Now... In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her, who was called barren, for with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. What a wonderful story. I'm going to come back there. Then I want to read to you a completely different part of the story is right at the end of the story. But I'm going to come back there again. And Matthew chapter 28, Jesus is raised from the dead. Okay, we've come from Christmas to Easter. We're doing the whole deal today. But there it says, And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren, to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. And then I want to read to you another scripture. Philippians chapter 4. One you know extremely well. Verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guide your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Three passages of Scripture. The thing they have in common is the word rejoice. I suppose you spotted that because you were supposed to. So, right, let's, let's talk a little bit about this. Now, let's look at that word, rejoice. And if you look in that, it comes from the root word, chairo, or it says, it's a greeting, grace to you, charete. Uh, that's what it says. I don't know if that relates to modern Greek. That's the old Greek. Rejoice! It's an instruction. 
It's the imperative. It says, rejoice. You have to rejoice. You've got a reason to rejoice. How many of you are glad that Jesus came? Hallelujah! So when we say rejoice, there's a reason to do it. Let's unpack that a little bit. How many of you have heard the word charis? As in charismatic. Okay? Some of you are a bit crazy. We call you charismaniacs. Okay? Yeah, I think, I think in Greek they say ephkaristos. Is that right? That's it. So it's still there. It's, it's still a living language. It's, you say, thank you. But charete would be rejoice. It all comes from this word charis, which means grace. Comes, it means grace. So, grace to you. Now, how many of you know what grace is? God's riches at Christ's expense, some people say. Grace is the most important thing that happened. There is a scripture that describes the grace of God. John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved Jalen that he gave his only son that because Jalen believes in him that he will not die, he will be saved. For God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. God saw us lost, full of sin, a big mess, and he poured out his love that we didn't deserve, because he, this world was full of sin, really, really far from God. But he didn't say, I'm, I'm too tired of this. I, he didn't say, I'm just going to let them all go to extinction. He actually loved us. And not only did He show mercy by not giving us what we deserved, He has made us part of His family. But there was a problem that God is just. And He had to do something about the problem of our rebellion and our sin. And that's why He had to send His own Son. To come into the world, to live a perfect life among us, and then get nailed to the cross, to die there instead of you and me. And that's what the Christmas, Christmas message is, that the Son of God was born as a human baby. And there he was, growing up, and he was God's Christmas present to us. The greatest gift God ever gave, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. His only begotten Son. And we are rejoicing. It's, some people will see that just as a greeting. It's much, much more. Because when the angel, let's go back to the first one, to Luke chapter 1. The angel says to her, Rejoice! Highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you amongst women. So let's talk about that. What he's saying is up to now, it's been the law of sin and death. But what he's saying is from now, the season is changing. Rejoice. It is the season of grace. Rejoice. Why? There's a reason to be glad. And there was a door that was closed to every single human being. Nobody from the time of Adam till the time of Jesus was able to come near the presence of God. God would appear on earth. He would come and speak to us sovereignly. But nobody could go into the presence of God. No one could see God and have face-to-face -face contact. Be in His presence because the sin of man kept us out. But this angel appears and says, this, this door that was closed is now opening up. And oh, there's still things that will keep us out. There's a, if you want to go and study this, it's actually incredibly interesting. Because he says, um, the, the angels speak to the, 
They're singing to the shepherd and they say, Good new, good will to me. And the angel says to the shepherd, This is good news to all men. So no one is left out. But there are things that we can put to keep us out and stop us having a reason to rejoice. It can be that we love the world, it can be that we love riches. Jesus said it's difficult for somebody who is rich to come into the presence of the Father. More difficult than a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Remember that? He says it said that if you love the world more than if you love the world, you can't have anything to do with God. There's many things that will keep us out of the presence of God. But that's not God's fault. The opportunity is now for everybody to come into the presence of God. And so we can rejoice. Heaven's gates are open wide. The second reason or thing about re rejoicing, I want to talk about the resurrection. If you read the story of the resurrection, who of you know who the first person was that saw Jesus come out of the, or he was out of the tomb? He didn't see him come out of the tomb, but when he was in the garden. Who saw him? Anybody know? Mary. Mary Magdalene. Okay. And who did she think he was? The gardener. And he looks at her and she says, Sir, where have they put Jesus? They must have moved him. And he looks at her and he just says, Mary. And she goes, looks at him, huge eyes. Rabona, teacher. Is that you? And she makes like she's going to throw her arms around him. He says, don't cling to me. I have not yet been to the Father. Am I right there, John 20? You go check it out for yourself. It's in there. I didn't put it in there because this, is, this isn't the whole Bible school, okay? But you can go look it up. And then I'm going to read you that scripture again. And I want to show you something. Something interesting has happened here. Matthew 28. And as they went to tell his disciples, who's that? That's the other ladies and Mary. They're all there now. And they, so Mary went there. She ran to, the, to tell the disciples, Peter and John have come and gone. And now the other ladies are early there. And now Jesus appears to them. Says, and as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Chayrete, rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet. Something's happened. Now they're allowed to hold his feet and worship him. Worshiped. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see. It's probably the shortest sermon Jesus ever preached because he didn't tell them all that had happened. Because if they were allowed to hold his feet, what is it saying? He's been, in that short time, he's been to the Father and he's come back. Because a little while before, he, she wasn't allowed to say anything. She wasn't allowed to touch him. Wasn't allowed to get a hug. Now they won't touch his feet. He's been. Let me tell you what's happened. Jesus has gone into the heavenlies. Hebrews chapter 9. Go read Hebrews chapter 9. Included in this one word sermon, he's saying, Rejoice! It's a whole new season of grace. Everything is different. I've been into the Father's presence. I've cleansed all the stench of human sin and Satan's operations out of heaven. It's now cleansed. And he's preached to all the Old Testament saints in Abraham's bosom. It tells us in the word that Jesus went and he preached to the, to the saints there. To the spirits that were held there. He's preached it to them. They are now released. They were released with Jesus. Uh, one of the Gospels tells us that when Jesus was raised that he, that there were people coming out of their tombs, all the Old Testament saints. 
They must have seen David and, and Hezekiah and those cool dudes walking around there. They were going around there. And, and it was, must have been amazing. But who's that? Oh, no, 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 that's Josiah. And, and there's Asa. Some of the good kings. There goes Jeremiah. That must have been brilliant. The one I would have liked to have seen was Isaiah. For unto us a child is born. He says, you guys didn't believe me. Now you see who he is. Imagine what it was like when he was preaching to them. And Isaiah finally understands. And King David, who wrote about Jesus in Psalm 2, is saying, Amen! And he looks across to Jeremiah and he says, Give us an Amen! And he says, Okay, we've had 69 weeks, but there's one week still to go. When are you coming back? <laughs> now, it must have been an amazing time when they understood but now Jesus has appeared in the garden and they can touch him. He's going to go to the Father. But the word he says is rejoice. I read there. Grace. Grace. It's all done. You are now in the season of grace because it is finished. Isn't that great news? When the, when the angel appeared and spoke to Mary and said, it's grace, Jesus completed the grace. What a wonderful moment. Let's go to number three. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. Because not only did we have grace then, you have grace now. You have a reason to rejoice now. Rejoicing is something that you don't just say, I'm happy because I love Jesus. Since he took my burdens and he rolled them in the, what, in the sea. I'm happy, yes. But there's more in rejoice. What you're saying is, I am moving and living in the grace of God. I am receiving it. I'm filled with joy because his grace is filling me. Do you see? You know, every little word in the Bible is like a whole atomic bomb worth of power. Just one word. There's so much in it. Rejoice in the Lord always. Why? And again, because every day there's more and more and more grace for you. It's beautiful. And then he says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Now, what is thanksgiving? Hey, Christ. It's the same word. It just says good grace. It's just got a bit of good in the front and the end of it. Why? Because that's what saying thank you is. God, your grace is good to me. God, you're so good to me. Thank you, Lord. So when you're saying thank you to the Lord, you're enjoying His grace and you're giving grace back to Him. Beautiful. There you, you, you see that. It's a beautiful, beautiful word. So you rejoicing over and over again because your joy is Jesus Christ. He was given as a baby. He gave himself as the Lamb of God. He's the high priest that cleansed the heavenlies. Now every need that you have. You can go into the presence of the Father and say, Lord, my Jesus made a way for me. He's been to cleanse the heavenlies and I can come into your presence and rejoice. And even when it gets tough, what does it say in James chapter 1 verse 2? Rejoice when you land in tough times. When you are facing hard things. Rejoice. For the testing of your faith produces patience. And you can rejoice with thanksgiving. And when you go before the Lord, you can say, I'm rejoicing, I'm receiving your grace, and I'm saying, thank you, grace, back to you. Isn't that beautiful? That's why when we say, do you ever wonder why the prayer that we have 
at, the, at, at meal times is called grace. Why wasn't it called thanks? That's why. They finished us. Thanksgiving. It's got the word grace in the middle. Thanks has the word grace in it. I bet you you all prayed and said grace your whole life and never known why. Well, now I've answered that question. Because when you say thank you, you say, God, it's your grace that's come to me and I'm giving it back to you. So this is the very simple part of our message today. So I want you to just take a moment. I'm going to pray a prayer. And I would like, if there's somebody here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, I would like you to ask Jesus into your life. That's the first thing. But secondly, I would like you to say thank you to Jesus and make rejoicing part of your arsenal, of your weaponry, of your life. That when you say I'm rejoicing, I'm receiving God's grace. I know what's in the grace. Father, I thank you today for each and every person who's here. Lord, I thank you for your amazing love and kindness. Thank you, Jesus, that as we go into your presence, we do so with great joy and love. Lord Jesus, I thank you that if there's anybody here today who's not yet received Jesus, received you into their life, Lord, won't you prompt them to invite you into their lives? Lord Jesus, won't you just fill them up with that incredible sense of your kindness? If there's anybody who wants to do that, won't you just put your hand up and say, that's me. Anybody here? Want to give your life to Jesus today? And just say thank you. Amen. Lord, every single person who's here today just wants to say thank you for the gift of Jesus. And we're going to rejoice in you. And we know we have access to the Father through your grace. Through your incredible love. And that we can draw on your love for us. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' amazing name. Amen. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Yeah. <laughs>